applied ego. Heidegger's thinking in being and time explained with Simon Critchley. Episode 18 Coda Opening and Presence At the end of the last episode, we looked at a footnote on page 500 where Heidegger traces the vulgar conception of time that he is opposing back to Aristotle and shows how figures like Hegel and Indeed, Heidegger's near contemporary Bergson, their thinking of time still derives from this Aristotelian conception. And this, at the end, brings us back to the beginning. In the end is our beginning. And I want to begin this ending by thinking about the relationship between the phenomenological and deconstructive aspects of this book that we're very close to finishing, Being in Time. That is the relationship between the constructive aspects of Being in Time, its extraordinary philosophical construction, innovation, and the relation of that to destruction, to what we're trying to dismantle, get away from. And this leads us back at the end, to the beginning of the book and the way in which Heidegger designs the treatise, Being in Time. So I'd like to get you to look at page 63 of the introduction. If you turn to page 63, 64, you see that Being in Time was originally designed envisaged to be in two parts. The first part, interpretation of Dasein in terms of temporality, explication of time as the transcendental horizon for the question of being, and part two, the basic features of of a phenomenological destruction of the history of ontology with the the problematic of temporality as our clue. Those two parts break down into three divisions. And what we've done in uh, these now 18 episodes is that we've looked at part one, divisions one and two, which constitute the published version of Being in Time. But here I just want to remind you that Being in Time was projected to be in these two parts. The first part, of which we've done divisions one and two of Being in Time, and then part two, likewise has three divisions. As Heidegger tirelessly insists and insisted after he'd written Being in Time and published it and it had been read, the whole project of the published portion of Being in Time is provisional and it's conditional upon the deconstruction of the history of ontology. As he says on page 26 of the German, which is, let me see, what page is that in the translation? Page 49 of the translation. The question of being does not achieve its true concreteness until we've carried through the process of destroying the ontological tradition. So as I've said uh, a number of times in these episodes, the whole premise for the phenomenology of Dasein and the phenomenology of Dasein as a preparation for the question of being as such is conditional upon uh, part two, the destruction of the history of ontology, none of which was published. So, as is known, and as is perhaps too well known, Heidegger didn't complete his task. He didn't finish the book 
being in time, and therefore the published volume remains a fragment or a torso. As many writers on Heidegger have said over the years. And that's true, right? We've just uh, looked at part of a much larger picture that Heidegger imagines in the design of this treatise. But, 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 there's a tendency to exaggerate this fragmentary nature of being in time. There's a tendency to exaggerate, there's a tendency in Heidegger himself and amongst Heideggerians towards what I would call a pathological provisionality. Pathological provisionality, where we continually emphasize the preparatory, provisional character, the... um, maybe doubtful, the questioning character of what's being articulated. Um, We're always on the way to something. We're never quite there. We're always on the way. And indeed, Heidegger's collected works, uh, the Gesamtausgabe, which are in many, 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 many volumes. There's a motto to Heidegger's collected works, which was Heidegger's own plan and certainly his own motto. And that motto was Wege nicht Werke, ways and not works, ways and not works. And Heidegger's um, was very fond of this idea of the way, of um, the Feldweg, of the way in the field, the idea of thinking as a way. One of his books is called Unterwegs zur Sprache, Unterwegs zur Sprache on the way to language. So we're always on the way for Heidegger. This isn't a work. This isn't a system. This isn't a completed edifice. This is something we are moving towards. That is fine. But what it leads to is a kind of uh, the risk of a fetishization of preparatory thinking, a fetishization of the provisional. And... It leads to a kind of um, fake humility in Heidegger's work and um, um, in, in the work of Heideggerians. Now, if we go back to the design of the thesis, the design of the treatise, sorry, parts one and two. If we look at that, if we have page 64 open under our eyes and we look at part one and part two, then we know that Part one, divisions one and two, we've done that. And we've done that in great depth in these episodes and we've made great progress and we should be proud of ourselves for having endured all the way to the end of Being in Time. It's a difficult book. Then if we look at part two of the um, imagined treatises, it's in three parts. First part on Kant, second part on Descartes, third part on Aristotle. Now, we would not have to be geniuses to realize that we can pretty much imagine what's going to take place in divisions one to three of part two. Everything turns back to Aristotle. And we've seen the basic argument of this movement back to Aristotle in that little footnote, uh, the, not the long footnote rather, at the end of the last chapter, And the argument of the last chapter as a whole and the whole, lots of other things in the book as a a whole. The argument about Kant was written as Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, a lecture series that was published in 1929. And the focus of the discussion of Kant was the schematism, the schematism of time, and the abyss of temporality from which Kant shrinks back. And again, what Heidegger says about Kant, we've seen that sketched in different moments in uh, in Being in Time. We've seen that in the introduction. We've seen that in the discussion of care and selfhood and other bits and pieces. So we can sort of imagine what Heidegger is going to say about Kant. And the second part on Descartes, well, We can kind of imagine that too from the various critiques of world, extension, 
and spatiality. Think all the way back to Division One, Chapter Three, where Heidegger's discussion of being in the world is contrasted with the Cartesian picture of the world. So it would not take a genius to sketch at least the contents of part two, divisions one to three. So if we lose a little bit of the provisionality, the fetishization of the preparatory and the towards, and we face up to what we've done in our reading of Heidegger and what we know already, then what is missing? What is missing from the treatise as a whole, as it was imagined by Heidegger, sketched on page 64? What's missing is part one, division three, time and being. Now, Heidegger himself tried to return to this topic, and indeed he used this title, Time and Being, in a lecture that he gave in 1961, which had that name, Time and Being. And I have a, a whole interpretation of that lecture, which uh, I've never spoken about for reasons I don't want to go into here. But I've never delivered that material on any occasion. But I have it all worked out and written down, an analysis of time and being, the 1961 lecture. And indeed, what he says about time and being is implicit in um, suggestions in being and time. And there is a lecture course that Heidegger gives in 1927 called The Basic Problems of Phenomenology, where Heidegger uh, tries to see through the analysis of time and being in a way that is really quite interesting and compelling. So, Heidegger's uh, provisionality in what he says, I think he overdoes it a little bit. Okay, where do I want to take that thought? Well, if we go to the marginal comments that Heidegger made on his own copy of the book, and in the, uh, the German edition, at the end of the German edition, there's a... A number of pages which are called marginal comments from the author's copy of the book. And where Heidegger is describing the design of the treatise, he makes a marginal comment in German on his own book. These marginal comments are very interesting because you see Heidegger reading Heidegger, which is a um, you know, strange and complicated thing to do when you've uh, written your own books, how you read them, what you say about them, you know, whatever. So Heidegger makes a comment on his own copy of Being in Time, just where he's laid out the design of the treatise, and he says the following. I'm translating here. What Heidegger says is the following. Difference in terms of transcendence the overcoming of the horizon as such, the turning back into the source, and the presencing out of this source. Right? That's Heidegger commenting on himself. I'm going to read that in German. Die transcendenzhafte Differenz die Überwindung des Horizonts als solchen, die Umkehr in die Herkunft, das Anwesen aus dieser Herkunft. Difference in terms of transcendence, the transcendentality of difference, overcoming of the horizon, turning back into the source, the presencing out of the source. What does that mean? Why does he say that when he is commenting on his own copy and his own imagining of the uh, design of his own treatise. I think he means the following, that the destruction of the history of ontology imagined in part two, as part two of Being in Time, is the path of a turning back into the source of time and being. 
deconstruction of the history of ontology is the path of a turning back into the source of time and being. Time as being, being as time. And what we receive when we turn back, when we've destroyed the tradition, what we receive is the presencing out of this source. The presencing out of this source. The original donation of being. Right? So, and the other thing which I should comment on is that when Heidegger says the overcoming of the horizon, so he's thinking about here that the uh, time is the horizon for the understanding of the meaning of being. But horizon itself is a problematic term for Heidegger because it's too spatial. The horizon is a kind of a limit, a spatial limit by which we understand time. It always already presupposes that we're understanding time in terms of a spatial metaphorics, and that is also something we need to call into question. So, transcendence, overcoming of the horizon, turning back into the source, presencing out of the source. So, once we've turned back into the source, once we've destroyed the tradition, then there can be a presencing, an anwesen out of this source. An original donation of being. I hope this doesn't sound too mysterious, because I don't want it to sound mysterious, but to make things worse, there is a, a late text by Heidegger called The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking. It's a lecture, most of Heidegger's work after being in time was lectures, essays. Um, this is a, a late lecture by Heidegger. Um, and the last words of the lecture, um, he says the following, I'm just going to read it to you. This is from Basic Writings, Heidegger's Basic Writings, page 392. Does not the title for the task of thinking then read, instead of being in time, opening and presence? Does not the title, the task of thinking, instead of being in time, read opening and presence? But where does the opening come from and how is it given? What speaks in the it gives, es gibt? that there is. The task of thinking would then be the surrender of previous thinking to the determination of the matter, the thinking. As often in Heidegger, there is illumination and there is um, a little obscurity. But what I want you to um, think about here is that a way of thinking about being in time is that what Heidegger is trying to get us to think and to, to really do in our thinking under the title of being is opening. We can think about Dasein, the human being, as opening, as a cleared opening, as a thrown cleardness. Right? The idea of us as open, as opening, as ecstatic. And that ecstatic opening that is us is an opening to presence, Anwesenheit. This isn't the uh, metaphysics of presence, right? That is frozen in the idea of now time, but a fuller and more compelling and rounded idea of presencing into which we enter and of which we're a part. So think about being in time as opening and presence, and think about the, the treatise as a whole as, on the one hand, this construction of concepts in the two divisions that we've seen, the condition of possibility for that, the way in which that's going to become concrete is through a deconstruction of the tradition 
And once that turning back into the source and that deconstruction of the tradition has been achieved, then there can be, um, then there can be an opening. Then there can be uh, a kind of presencing out of this source. With those slightly weird thoughts in mind, let's turn to the end of being in time. Paragraph 83. I'm going to read you some passages and then um, make some comments. So now I'm on page 486, right at the end of the book. I'm going to read four, four quotes and then say some things about them. So let's look at paragraph 83. In our considerations hitherto, beginning with paragraph 83, our task has been to interpret the primordial whole of factical Dasein with regard to its possibilities of authentic and inauthentic existing, and to do so in an existential ontological manner in terms of its very basis. Temporality has manifested itself as this basis and accordingly as the meaning of the being of care. So we get a lovely summary of the argument of being in time. So that which our preparatory, preparatory notes in italics, existential analytic of Dasein contributed before temporality was laid bare, has now been taken back into temporality as the primordial structure of Dasein's totality of being. In terms of the possible ways in which primordial time can temporalize itself, we've provided the grounds for those structures which were just pointed out in our earlier treatment. Nevertheless, our way of exhibiting the constitution of Dasein's being remains only one way which we may take. Our aim is to work out the question of being in general. The thematic analytic of existence, however, first needs the light of the idea of being in general, which must be clarified beforehand. The third quotation is from further down on page 487. I'll keep these four, uh, four bits together in our, in our minds. So those are the first two quotes, which indeed are kind of joined together. The third quote, bottom of page 487, one must seek a way of casting light on the fundamental question of ontology. And this is the way one must go. Whether this is the only way, or even the right one at all, can be decided only after one has gone along it. You see what Heidegger's doing here? He's um, giving us a summary of what he's done magnificently in this book, and then he seems to be pulling it away from us. This is only one way. Our aim was to work out the question of being, but still, we still haven't thought about what the idea of being in general really means. This is, the, this, is, uh, this is the way we followed in being in time. Is this the only way? Is it the right one at all? It can only be decided after one has gone along it. Then he says, the conflict as to the interpretation of being cannot be allayed because it has not yet been enkindled. That reference to conflict there is an allusion to the, the conflict of the giants the gigantomachia peritasusias, the, G- the battle of the giants ar- around being, which he alludes to at the very, very beginning of the introduction to being in time. So that conflict hasn't even begun. And it can only be decided whether it was the right way after one has gone along that way. Hmm. Let's look at how the book finishes. Page 488. Something like being has been disclosed in the understanding of being which belongs to existent Dasein as a way in which it understands. Being has been disclosed in a preliminary way, though non-conceptually. Notice preliminary, preparatory. These, this emphasis is upon um, the provisionality of what Heidi is up to here. And this makes it possible for Dasein as existent being in the world to comport itself towards entities, towards those which it encounters within the world as well as towards itself as existent. How is this disclosive understanding of being at all possible for Dasein? Can 
this question be answered by going back to the primordial constitution of being of that Dasein by which being is understood. The existential ontological constitution of Dasein's totality is grounded in temporality. Hence, the ecstatical projection of being must be made possible by some primordial way in which ecstatical temporality temporalizes. How is this mode of the temporalizing of temporality to be interpreted? Is there a way which leads from primordial time to the meaning of being? Does time manifest itself as the horizon of being? At which point one is inclined to say, you know, what the fuck, Martin? You said on the first page of this book that time is the horizon for the understanding of being. And now you say at the end, does time itself manifest itself as the horizon of being? Why are you pulling everything away? So, I want to finish by casting some doubt about this rhetorical move or series of rhetorical moves at the end of Heidegger's uh, Being in Time, which is something which is indicative of his style and the style of thinkers uh, who claim to follow him. While it is indeed true that the hermeneutic of Dasein remains only one way in which the question of being might be pursued, and that the Dasein analytic is only a point of departure, only a point of departure for universal phenomenological ontology, as he says on page 486, and while it is also true that the question as to whether this is the only way that can or should be pursued is something that can be decided only after one has gone along it, and as such the conflict, the gigantomachia with regard to the interpretation of being has not even begun, has not even been enkindled, and that this investigation is and it's such a key Heideggerian word, it's only underway. Despite all of that, there is no question that Heidegger has given us more than a clue as to how the closing questions of the book are to be interpreted. So let's go back to those final words of being in time. Heidegger um, loses us with these rhetorical questions. It's as if the whole ladder is being kicked away. We've learned nothing. And I think we've learned a lot more than nothing. So he says, look at the final two sentences of being in time. Is there a way that leads from primordial time to the meaning of being? Yes. Yes. There is a way from the primordial temporalizing of temporality ecstatic Dasein, it's been described beautifully and powerfully in being in time, there is a way from there to the meaning of being. And the last sentence of the book, does time itself manifest itself as the horizon of being? Yes, time understood in this sense does manifest itself as the horizon of being. Even, even, if the concept of horizon must be overcome, going back to that marginal comment that Heidegger makes, even if we have to, you know, have a better concept than horizon, there's no question that time is the way in which being as such, the meaning of being is to be understood. So this is what I want to emphasize in the end of this uh, journey. I worry a little about the false modesty of these potentially paralyzing rhetorical questions at the end of being in time. The false modesty and the willful self-paralyzing 
of um, readers of Heidegger. This could turn into a more general remark upon my uh, hatred for book titles and paper titles that include the words towards, you know, towards a theory of X or notes towards a theory of Y, right? So the endless, I've seen this so many times with students and with faculty, you know, they'll write a paper, three abstract nouns, you know, contingency, irony, solidarity, universality, recognition, justice, colon, notes towards a theory of blah, 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 blah. Don't include that in your writing. Never use the words towards, never say these are notes, either write something or don't write something, have the courage of your own convictions. This is just uh, the failure of towardsism. Don't like that. And also in relationship to what we've done in um, these episodes, these this long journey that we've taken reading Being in Time, we've learned a ton of stuff, a massive amount. And we need to acknowledge that, absorb it, and then use it to transform our understanding of everything. Ourselves, others, world, space, time, history, you name it. Being in Time is a book that changes one's life. I do believe that. Doesn't mean it's right. There's lots of criticisms I have of this book, as has become clear in these episodes, but I passionately believe that this is the right orientation. This is the right path to be followed in philosophy, even if many of the turnings that Heidegger took on that path are doubtful. Other ways could be chosen. So the Dasein analytic is a point of departure. Yes, it's also something to which a universal phenomenological ontology must return, right? So there's a tendency in Heidegger discussion to say, well, early Heidegger was fine, but he was much too concerned with the perspective of the human being. And we have to concern ourselves with being as such. I dispute that. Dasein is being in the world is a much broader claim than that. And we have all the elements in place for an understanding of being, of the meaning of being. It's evident. And we have to continually return to the standpoint of us, Dasein, and our mindness. That's where we begin. So the Dasein analytic, the analytic of us, is ineliminable even if its character must change, its method perhaps must change, and indeed it does change in Heidegger's later work. Furthermore, we've been told what the meaning of being human is. The meaning of being human is finitude. That's it. The clue for unraveling the experience of finitude are the concepts of throne projection and factical existing. Right? Dasein is throne projection. Dasein exists factically. What that means is that we're finite. Right? And these are clues that we followed in this, these discussions over, the, over these episodes. Discussions of death, conscience, temporality, and historicity, each of which deepen and thicken the insight into throne projection, into the being of what Heidegger calls care. So we've learned a lot. Our view of things has changed, and I want that to stay with us. But, and here's a, a closing thought. If the being of being human is finite, then... Can the meaning of being as such be anything other than finite? No. Right? So the way Heidegger throws up his arms at the end of this book is perfectly pointless. We are finite. Right? The being of being human is finite. The being of being as such is also finite. It's, as Heidegger will say in his later work, it's epochal. It's dispensed 
in historical epochs. Right? So um, being cannot be thought independently from the experience of throne projection, from factical existence and the Daseinness of this experience. No. And this is something that I would like to um, use and maybe insist upon as a clue in reading Heidegger's later work. Heidegger does not give us a metaphysical determination of being. He does not give us uh, an answer to the question of the meaning of being. Rather, rather, he names an experience. Right? Heidegger is trying to name an experience that corresponds to the lack of a word for being that characterizes our age. This is where he's going to go in the later work. The, the master word of Heidegger's later work is das Ereignis, right? the appropriative event or the opening. So the question of being, the question of the meaning of being, really is a question for Heidegger about meaning, about what shows itself. Heidegger is not trying to get us to think about being as if it was something hidden beneath the surface of things, right? As if there was some kind of mystery that we can, we can, we can touch, we can reach out and, um, and touch, but it evades our grasp. In Heidegger's later work, the question of being, the, the theme, the word being is even crossed out. He uses it, you know, under erasure. The master word of Heidegger's later work is the appropriative event opening. And that idea of opening, event of appropriation, is another way of thinking about throne projection. It's another way of thinking about the enigmatic depth, difficulty of what it means to be, to be human. So I don't see a fundamental shift or a turning in Heidegger's thoughts at all. I think the Heidegger has different ways of approaching the same matter. And that matter is the, the matter of thinking, which is the question of the meaning of being. And that is something that has to pass through an analysis of who we are. The answer to who we are in being and time is thrown projection. The answer to who we are in the later work is the appropriative event and those two uh, ways of thinking, I think, are consistent. Um, so, where does that leave us in closing? Being in time is essential to the entirety of Heidegger's project. And if we were going to carry on with these episodes into another series of episodes in Heidegger's later work, I, could, uh, I think I could show that. I don't think there's a break. I think there's a deepening. I think there are different questions that uh, come to Heidegger's mind. The question of metaphysics changes in Heidegger's work. Uh, the focus of Heidegger's work is often historical. He reflects upon um, figures from the history of philosophy, but he's trying to dig into the same matter. So from being in time to time and being, there is a, there is a continuity, there is a deepening. There is a, a questioning. The last word would maybe go back to, to something that I mentioned early on in these lectures or at a certain point in these lectures, which is um, a story I told you about meeting Hans Georg Gadamer when I was 26 years old and how terrifying that was. And I was having uh, breakfast. Uh, and I was in Italy for the first time in my life, and I was hung over. I was hiding in the corner of the breakfast room and um, trying to eat and gather my wits. And in came Hans Georg Gadamer uh, on his walking stick and slowly seemed to move, was moving towards me and sat down at the table. And uh, I thought, oh no. It's Gadamer. What am I going to talk to him about? And he just started to talk. He started to speak. At this point, Gadamer had decided that he was going to um, serve as a kind of a messenger for his teacher, Heidegger. 
he thought of Heidegger as a, a greater thinker than himself, um, whether rightly or wrongly. And this was when the the Marburg lectures, the lectures where Heidegger had worked out the uh, the shape of being in time, had been published in German and English, and um, Gadamer was going around talking about them. And so he sat there at the breakfast table and was talking to me or just speaking. And he said to me, I mentioned this once before, that, you know, Heidegger, you know, wrote one book, Being in Time. Everything else he published were collections of essays or lecture courses or fragments that were put together. This was his book. And it's a failure in the sense in which Heidegger abandons the method of transcendental phenomenology as a way of access to the question of being. Uh, he thinks that there are other ways of approaching this question in his later work, historical, uh, reflective, poetic. Gadamer said that Heidegger spent his career building castles in the air. And that's another way of kind of playing down the importance of what Heidegger's up to in his work. Sure, these are castles in the air, but this is not a criticism. The activity of thinking is building castles in the air. All that there is, is air. Eh? This is air, the air I'm speaking to you through and with. Hopefully it's not just been hot air, but we've learned something over these episodes. And we build castles, and that's fine. And then we discover those castles are not perfect and we construct other castles and we go on. The point is that we have learned a huge amount. I think that being in time, unlike any other book that I know, can fundamentally shift the way in which uh, one understands uh, oneself, the world and uh, other people and uh, it's a way of focusing on the simplicity, obviousness, and banality of everyday existence and a way of finding concepts that are the equivalent to that. And it makes other ways of doing philosophy redundant. It makes traditional ways of doing philosophy redundant. It opens up a whole series of questions. Uh, I think Heidegger's work initiates that tradition of thinking continued in figures like Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, and then um, Levinas, Derrida, which are, they're all thinkers who raise questions to Heidegger, but from within the framework which Heidegger has established. There's a remark that Levinas makes, and maybe I'll finish with this. This is at the, at the end of a book that Levinas published in 1947 called From Existence to the Existent, De l'Existence à l'Existent, which itself is a kind of provocation to Heidegger. Heidegger's trying to take us from the human being to being, and Levinas is reversing that direction, taking us from the question of existence to the existent, back to Dasein. He says at the beginning of that book that we must leave the climate of Heidegger's thinking we must leave the climate of Heidegger's thinking for obvious reasons, reasons which are at least political and also conceptual. But, Levinas goes on, we cannot leave that climate for a, a philosophy that would be, that would be pre-Heideggerian. We have to leave the climate of Heidegger's thinking, but not for a philosophy that would be pre-Heideggerian. Namely, that... What happens in being in time is a paradigm shift in the way in which we see the basic questions of philosophy and thinking. Once we accept that paradigm shift, then we move on and develop those questions in freer, more interesting and more independent ways. And that's the task that uh, awaits all of us individually in the thinking that we will go on to develop and I hope that that thinking is influenced by Heidegger's work. If you've got to the end of this, this marathon, then thank you for listening. And I hope to speak to you again at some point before too long, as long as we have the time. Okay, thank you very much. And 
Bye-bye for now.